Hi, welcome back to the CSET Subtest 3 series. Today, part 2 is on derivatives. I highly recommend that you check out the What is a Derivative video to get a better conceptual idea of, well, what is a derivative. The link will be in the description down below. So let's get straight into some practice problems. For our problem set 1, we're going to want to approximate the function f of x equals to x squared by the line tangent to f of x at x equals 2. Step 1 will be to find the y value. The problem statement gives us that the x coordinate that we'll be using is 2, so we'll use this to find our y value. Why do we need this piece of information? We'll cover that in our next step. To find the y value, we'll input the given x value into our function. Before moving on to step two, let's review two formulas of a line. We have the typical y equals mx plus b, and we also have y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. For our purposes, we're going to use a second formula since we don't have a y-intercept that's needed for the first formula. We already have the x value and now we have the y value, so the only piece of information that's missing is m, which is our slope. Well, the line tangent or the tangent line is our derivative, which is a slope at one point. Therefore, our step two will be to find the derivative of f of x. Solving for that, we'll find that the derivative equals two times x. Now that we have our actual derivative formula, we'll want to find the derivative at our one point. So we'll use our x value of two to plug into our derivative we end up with four. This is a slope at our one point. Our final step is to plug our variable into the line formula. We have our point two comma four and our slope four. After we simplify using some handy dandy algebra, we get that y equals 4x minus 4, which is our final answer. For problem 1b, it's the same idea just in multiple choice format, just like it would be in your exam. You can try using the same steps to solve this problem, so try solving this problem on your own. Pause for a quick tip. Since we found that our slope is 8, a positive 8, we can probably use this to eliminate some of our choices that don't match. Hopefully, after you work through the problem, you end up with option C. So a quick recap on solving these types of problems. You will want to first find the coordinating y value, then the derivative at your one point using the given x value. Then you can plug these variables into your line formula to find the correct answer. Another tip to these types of problems is you can plug in your given x value directly into your multiple choices, and you should end up with the y value you found in step one, since the point lies on the line. Find which methods best work for you, and I highly suggest you practice those to do well on these types of problems. Okay, so for problem set two, we're going to be diving into limits and derivatives. When you have a limit, your first instinct will probably be to plug in the y value the limit is approaching, in this case, x approaching zero, into sine of x over x. When we try that out though, we get 0 over 0, and that's not a good answer. That's not what we want. When we end up with something like this, we'll want to use L'Hopital's rule. So when do we use this rule? Well, two of the most common situations that we'll need to use L'Hopital's rule is when the limit gives us 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. The rule states that in these circumstances, in these situations, we'll want to take the derivative of the top 
and at the bottom and then try plugging in A. We'll want to do this as many times needed until we no longer have zero over zero or infinity over infinity. So let's take this back to our problem. Since we ended up with zero over zero, we're gonna wanna take the derivative of the top and of the bottom. This does not mean we're taking the quotient rule. No, no, no. We need to take the derivative of the top and then the bottom separately. After we simplified that, in this case, we'll end up with cosine of x. And when we plug in zero, we get one. And this would be our final answer here. If you need a trig review, check out part one of the CSET subtest series. Check out the link in the description below. Okay, how about you try question 2b? Pause for a review. Just in case you forgot what e to the infinity would be, we can graph e to the x. As we move towards the positive infinity direction, our curve is forever increasing, meaning that e to the infinity is infinity. When we have to take multiple L'Hopital's, we want to take the derivative of the previous function we found. Okay, so at this point, it might be confusing to see an infinity sign and wonder if this is a correct answer. Well, if we look at the function here, we get infinity over infinity, which we found was not something that we want. However, when we have infinity over a constant, that simply gives us infinity. So this is an acceptable answer. And in this case, our answer will be B. Moving on to problem set three. For what values of x does the instantaneous rate of change of f of x equals to x squared equals the average rate of change of f of x on the closed interval from 1 to 9? The instantaneous rate of change is the derivative, and the average rate of change is delta y over delta x, or the slope between two points. So that means that the difference between these two is that the derivative is the slope at one instant versus two points like the average rate of change. So step one will be to further define. Looking at the context of this word problem will help us better understand what they're asking us. Here it's saying that the instantaneous rate of change, which is f prime of x, our derivative, is equal to the average rate of change, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is the equation of our slope between two points. Now that we have that, step two will be to find the derivative, which is simply 2x. Then we're going to want to find the average rate of change. To do so, we'll need to find the y values of our endpoints, so f of 1 and f of 9. Once we have both points, we can plug it into our slope formula or our average rate of change formula, and we'll end up getting 10. So our final step will be to plug in. Our derivative is 2x, which is set equal to our average rate of change, which we found to be 10. We can now solve for x since we're asked for the values of x and we end up getting 5. Awesome, so now try solving problem 3b. Here are the steps for reference. Hopefully you end up with the final answer as C. Now for problem four, we have x y squared minus x cubed y equal to six is defined on the x y plane. Find values of x where the line tangent to the curve is vertical. So the first thing we notice is that our given equation is made up of x and y's. Since we're asked to find the x values, we need to figure out y in terms of x. Also, using the context clues from the problem statement, we're told that the line tangent to the curve, or 
the derivative is vertical. The derivative is represented by dy over dx, or y prime. So in looking for the tangent line to the curve, aka the derivative of our equation, we'll want to keep in mind y prime. I'm going to break down how we'll calculate the derivative piece by piece. For the first piece of this equation, x times y squared, we're going to want to take the product rule. The first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. When we take the derivative of any y variable, we'll need to keep the y prime since it's associated with the derivative of y. With a little rewriting, we get 2xy times y prime plus y squared. The y squared does not have a y prime since we weren't taking the derivative of the y variable at this point in the product rule. Next, we'll have to do the same thing for x cubed times y. When putting these pieces together, don't forget your negative. It needs to be distributed. And for our third piece, the six, the derivative of a constant is just zero. The goal at this point is to solve for y prime, or a tangent line. So we'll do some algebra to get y prime alone. From this point, try solving for y prime. You should end up with 3x squared y minus y squared all over 2xy minus x cubed. Now that we have our derivative, we need to understand what it means when the derivative is vertical or even horizontal. So take this vertical and horizontal line. If you forget which is which, the line where you can draw a sun over the horizon will be your horizontal line. At least that's how I like to remember it. This horizontal line will give you a slope of zero, and the vertical line will give you a slope of infinity. So in a fraction, when would the fraction produce an infinity or a zero? Well, to produce infinity, you'll want to divide by zero, or set the denominator equal to zero. And to produce a zero, we'll set the numerator equal to zero. In our case, we're looking for when the tangent line is vertical, so we'll want to set the denominator equal to zero. So what do we do with this now? So if we solve for y, we'll get y in terms of x and be able to plug this into our original equation to solve for x. So solving for y and simplifying, we'll get that y equals x squared all over 2. So now that we have our y in terms of x when the tangent line is vertical, we could plug this back into our given equation to find the actual values of x. So let's substitute x squared over 2 for y. A friendly reminder when you're multiplying exponents with the same base, you should be adding them, not multiplying. So we should get x to the fifth. After further algebra, we get that x equals the fifth root of negative 24. It might be tempting to think that a negative within a fifth root is wrong, but it is acceptable. Negatives in odd roots is okay, but not okay in even roots, like squared root. If you like your video on that, actually, let me know in the comments below. So our final answer here will be b. Now for our final and most challenging problem. We're told that an isotope has a half-life of 24,100 years. So disclaimer, I keep saying 24,100 years, but I keep writing 24,000 years. So just keep that in mind, it doesn't change any of the calculations. Back to the problem. If 5 grams of the isotope are present at t equals 0, how long will it take for the amount of the isotope to decay to 1 gram? The rate of decay with respect to time is directly proportional to the amount of isotope, where k is a constant of proportionality. So step one will be to define. 
Let's start with rate of decay. So our rate of decay is taken with respect to time. Usually what follows respect to, so in this case time, is placed in the denominator of our derivative. There are exceptions to this rule, which we'll actually see later on in this problem. So the rate of decay is the decay of amount of isotope. So we'll represent that by P. Rate of change is directly proportional to the amount of isotope times our constant. So it equals to K times P. We can't use this formula DP over DT equals to K times P to find time but its antiderivative is a function of time. So to find that, our next step will be to take the integral. To find the antiderivative, we'll need to separate the variables since p is actually a function of time, meaning it's dependent on t. So we can't just integrate it like it would be a constant. This is also known as a separable differential equation. If you would like a video on that, let me know in the comments below. Okay, so to do so, dt will be need to be moved to the right side and p to the left. So we'll divide by p and multiply by dt to everything. We'll end up with dp over p equal to k times dt. And now we can integrate. In separable differential equations, each side ends up with a respect to variable. So for example, on the left side, we have the integral of 1 over p with respect to dp which is equal to the natural log of p. And on the right side, we have the integral of the constant k with respect to dt, meaning that our input value is t. So the integral of a constant in this case would just be k times t, plus c, which is the integration constant, so we don't need to put plus c on both sides. One is good enough here. Now that we're done taking the integral, we'll want to solve for p. And to get p out of that natural log, we'll want to raise both sides to the exponential function of base e, since it's the opposite of natural log. Just as multiplication is the opposite of division, and adding is the opposite of subtraction. So we get p equals to e to the kt times e to the c. Since e to the c will give us just a constant, we'll replace it with just c. So before moving on to step three, Let's do a quick recap. We're trying to find how long it will take for the isotope to decay to one gram, or when p equals one. In this case, we'll be trying to solve for t. So if we look here under step three, we're given p equals c times e to the kt, meaning that when we're ready to solve for t, we know what p is, but we don't know what c or k is. So we'll need to solve for those variables before being able to move on. So step three will be to find C. We can use the given information that at T equals zero, we have five grams of the isotope. This can be rewritten into a point zero comma five. Since our coordinate points in this problem is T comma P, we can simply plug in these numbers to simplify and solve for C. If you forget what e to the zero is, we can graph the exponential graph and find that our y-intercept is zero. So when t equals zero, our output is one. Also, any number to the zero equals one. So we find that our constant equals five. Our only unknown variable left is k. To find k, we'll be using our half-life given information. So we're going to use 24,100 years as our t for our half-life piece of info. So this might be confusing because we just said that we're looking for t, but we are asked to find t when the amount of isotope is one gram. So this 24,100 years is only associated with the half-life of this isotope. So p will be the half-life of our original amount of isotope, which we know is five, or the constant we just found for t equals zero. So in this case, p equals 2.5. Now, try solving for k. This is definitely the challenge question in our derivative practice review because it involves a lot of different pieces of information. 
On a multiple choice, you might not have to calculate every variable we're finding in this problem, but I want to break it down just in case you have to find, let's say, k instead of t or c instead of t. This will prep you to tackle a question like this from different angles. So once you're done solving for k, you should end up with a natural log of 1 half all over 24,100. And finally, we're ready to solve for step 5, which is to find t when p equals to 1 gram. We'll plug in 1 for p, 5 for c, and the natural log of 1 half all over 24,100 for our k. Now, try solving for t. Remember that dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal. So we end up with t equal to the natural log of 1 fifth times 24,100 all over the natural log of 1 half. I'm going to stop here and box this as my final answer. For a multiple choice, you'll probably get cleaner answers, but once again, we solve for each variable to understand different questions the exam could potentially ask you regarding this type of word problem. I hope you found this helpful. If you have any further questions, let me know down in the comments below. Good luck studying, be sure to subscribe, stay curious, and I'll see you next time.